But anyway, um, I want to give you the opportunity to just uh, open your Bible. Uh, we're going to read the scriptures in John 11, uh, verse 25. If you got your Bibles ready, um, let's uh, read that chapter, uh, those, those Bible verses. And um, we are getting close to uh, celebrate Easter. So Jesus will be, will be celebrate, celebrating the resurrection. So uh, verse 25, Jesus said to, uh, to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live and not even talk, they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? And this is the one that I, this is the word, my words that I really like. Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. Let's pray. Señor Jesucristo, creemos que tú eres la resurrección y creemos que tú eres el Dios verdadero. Lord Jesus, we believe that you are the resurrection and you are the true God. También creemos, Señor, que a través de ti podemos encontrar la salvación. We also believe, Lord Jesus, that through you we can find salvation. Porque tú cuando fuiste a la cruz del Calvario, Señor, moriste para salvarnos. Because when you went to the cross, Lord Jesus, you went to the cross to save us. Ahora, Cristo Jesús, te pedimos, Señor, para que tú nos sigas fortaleciendo en medio de esta pandemia que aún sigue. Lord Jesus, now we pray that you will continue to um, give us strength on the middle of this pandemic that's still going on. Oro por aquellas personas que están pasando todavía por esos momentos difíciles. Oro por aquellas personas que fueron eh, también dañadas por el tornado y que están pasando todavía las consecuencias. I pray, Lord Jesus, for those who are going through pandemic still, who, who are suffering a pandemic. And I also pray for those who are still, uh, Lord Jesus, going through the damage they suffer during the tornado. Entonces, Cristo Jesús, queremos en este momento ponernos en tus manos. And Lord Jesus, at this moment, we want to um, be uh, in your hands para que tú seas el que nos guíe. So you can guide us eh, y nos hagas saber y hacer lo que tú quieras que hagamos. Eh, so you can guide us and, and take us to a place where you want us to be. Oramos en tu nombre porque tu nombre es grande y poderoso. We pray in your name because your name is great and, and powerful. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
cross. Jesus is waiting. God so loved the world.
would like to invite you, wherever you are around the world, to raise your voice and get in on singing together Psalm 150. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. You made the starry host, you trace the mountain peaks, you paint the evening skies with wonders. The earth, it is your throne. Testifies your splendor. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Sing his greatness, all creation. Praise the Lord, raise your voice. You heights in all your depths, from furthest east to west. Let Jesús, que tú tienes ese poder 
no solamente para haber resucitado tú, sino también para resucitarnos a nosotros. And one more time, Lord Jesus, we believe that you have the power not only to resurrect yourself, but give us the resurrection. Creemos, Cristo Jesús, que tú eres nuestro Dios verdadero. We believe you are our true God. Creemos, Señor, que tú puedes protegernos de todo lo que está pasando alrededor. We believe in your protection. And we believe that you can protect us about all the things that are going around us. Lord Jesus, be with us today. And also I pray, Lord Jesus, you open our hearts and our minds to listen to what your servant has for us this morning. We pray in your name, in the name of Jesus Christ. spoken to you uh, wherever you are listening from and uh, um, I'm looking forward to sharing this particular message with you it's a heavy message and so I just want to say that up front also it could be rather long but you're at home so if you need to stop go get a cup of coffee come back please feel free uh, to do that I tried as I was preparing this particular sermon um, it's on repentance and the title of the sermon is repent 
Um, I thought about, well, how can I make this into a two-part uh, sermon? And uh, that might could have been done, but then I thought, well, I think we would lose some stuff between part one and part two. And so let's take the extra time this morning and uh, just look at this, uh, this word repent and what it means in the Old Testament and the New Testament and how uh, it is so important for us uh, today. Uh, from my perspective, this may be one of the more important sermons I've preached in quite a while. And so um, uh, just bear with me and hang in there with me and uh, we'll get through this uh, together. But again, feel free to stop. We'll get something, come back and, and, and all of that. That's one of, I guess, one of the blessings of, um, of recording the service. And so anyway, so uh, there's several passages of scripture I want to look at. There's two rather long passages and we'll, we'll open our Bibles to those places when we get to them. Most of the other verses are going to be on the, on the screen and the PowerPoint so you can follow along. And I pray that you've got your Bibles with you. Um, you know, get a piece of paper, take some notes, and uh, let's talk about this incredibly important subject, repent. And uh, but before we do, let me pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your many blessings and just, again, for the opportunity to be here. And I pray that you would be with us today as we talk about this subject, speak to our hearts, challenge us, convict us, but also, Father, give us hope uh, because we know that your grace and your mercy forgives us of our sins when we repent. And so just watch over us this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So, repent. What do you think of when you hear that word, repent? Well, do you think of an angry man standing on the corner wearing signs and yelling into a megaphone, repent? I've got a few pictures I want to show you about that. Maybe uh, it is someone like this first picture that you see uh, wearing the billboard and at the bottom it says repent or uh, maybe it's like uh, the, the second picture that should be coming up uh, where uh, the guy on the left is you know Jesus Christ is coming repent and then for some reason Mark Simpson is on the other side of that particular uh, picture or maybe the, when you think of this man standing on the corner you think of that uh, that third picture of the man who just is holding the sign, repent. Or maybe when you think of the word repent, that you think of billboards that you see along the interstate as you travel, uh, like the one that should be coming up now. Uh, where are you going, heaven or hell? And I wonder sometimes, are those signs really effective? Or maybe what comes to your mind when you hear the word repent, if you grew up uh, in the church, is that hellfire and brimstone preacher um, of your youth. You know, my dad and granddad could really get with it in their sermons, and my dad was an evangelist, and I tell people I got saved hundreds of times growing up because, you know, I didn't want to go to hell. I, want, I wanted to repent and make sure. And so if you grew up in church, maybe you have that type of picture in your mind, or it could be a tamer, but yet no less effective, Billy Graham crusade. Uh, so many people have repented and come to Christ uh, through his ministry. So what comes to your mind when you hear that word, repent? Whatever you think, there's a lot of people who when they hear that word, they have a negative reaction to it. Some 20 plus years ago, I got a phone call uh, from a church member who said that their cousin had had an accident at work and this was a serious accident. The accident resulted in him losing both of his arms and the majority of his body uh, was burnt. He was in intensive care at the Vanderbilt burn unit and, and was not expected to make it. And so I went to the hospital to spend time with the family and to pray and just to be there with them. Miraculously, this guy um, survived. And after months of therapy, he and his family started to attend church. And, and over the course of time, I had the privilege of baptizing him and other members of his family. But in one of my first conversations with him, after he was out of intensive care and, and once he was able uh, to communicate, on one of those first conversations I had with him, he described to me what took place at that accident. And he, he had a vivid memory of what, of what took place. But then he said that while he was laying on the ground, the accident, he ended up on the ground, and the paramedics were around him and the other people who he was working with, 
But he, he told me that while he was laying on the ground, he had an out-of-body experience. In fact, the medical records would show that they did have to bring him back two or three times uh, while he was laying on the ground. But he described this out-of-body ex experience. And he described that he, he, could, he was above his body and watching the people working on him and, and bringing him back to life. And then he got really serious. And he said, Pastor, you know how people who have had these near-death experiences talk about a bright light that is pulling them and they feel peace and love coming from that light? I said, yeah. He said, well, that wasn't my experience. He said, I was headed toward complete darkness and I could hear screaming. If those paramedics, he said, if those paramedics had not brought me back to life, I would be in hell. I am confident that's where I was headed. He then asked to help, he then asked me to help him repent and ask Jesus into his life, and, and that's what we did. But for him, even though repentance was scary, not repenting was even scary. So what is repentance? And what does it mean to repent? Well, a few weeks ago, and I hope you watch this. If not, go back on YouTube and watch it. But a few weeks ago, Pastor CZ talked about repentance. And I've been thinking about some of the things that he said and just thinking about this idea of repentance ever since. Now, CZ's key verse was Isaiah chapter 30, verse 15. And the beginning of that verse reads, In repentance and rest is your salvation. The Hebrew word for repentance means to retire, among other things. And I like that idea. That repentance means I'm going to stop. I'm going to retire from that former way of life. But the Hebrew word means to retire or to withdraw or even to return. And in fact, that's how the King James Version translates it. The King James Version says, In returning and rest shall you be saved. The Hebrew word for salvation that is used there means to be free or to be rescued or to be victorious. And so the Old Testament idea of repentance is to withdraw or to retire from what you are doing and to return to what it is you know you should be doing. And by withdrawing and returning, you are set free and are victorious. On one occasion, after healing a crippled beggar in front of the temple gate called Beautiful, Peter turns to the crowd that had witnessed the miracle, and he says in Acts chapter 3, verse 19, Repent then, and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out. The Greek word for repent simply means to change your mind, to turn around, to change your mind. The idea, however, is that the very reason for changing your mind is because of deep sorrow, even abhorrence for your actions. And so the New Testament idea of repentance is to turn from your sins, a change of mind that comes out of deep sorrow, to return from your, sin, to turn from your sins and turn to God for forgiveness. He will wipe your sins out. If you combine the ideas of the Old and the New Testament, repentance then is turning from your former way of life because you realize that that way of life is wrong. Not that you got caught, but that it is wrong. That's the changing of your mind. That's the returning. And then turning to God for forgiveness so that you may be set free to live a victorious life. Who among us? doesn't want to be set free from our guilt and sorrow. Who among us doesn't want to walk in victory? John the Baptist exhorts us in Matthew chapter 3 verse 8, he exhorts us to produce fruit in keeping with repentance. But what is that fruit? What is the fruit of repentance? Well, among other things, it is freedom, victory, forgiveness, Gratitude, compassion, and power. 
There is a scene in John Bunyan's classic allegory, Pilgrim's Progress, that describes what it is like not to repent. This scene is all the more haunting when you realize that a lot of literary scholars believe that Bunyan is describing his good friend and fellow minister, Reverend John Chow, when he describes this particular scene. Reverend Chow, Chow, who for fear of persecution, and remember John Bunyan was in a dungeon when he received this dream that he wrote down as Pilgrim's Progress, and he was there being persecuted because he was preaching the gospel in England. But his friend, Reverend Chow, compromised his faith because he didn't want to be uh, persecuted, and, and he compromised his faith for political expediency in order to win favor with the Queen of England. And so in this scene, Christian, that's the main character, is touring different rooms in the house of interpreter, and that's the man who is showing him around. The sixth room that Christian and interpreter come to to visit is the room called the room with the iron gate. As the name suggests, in the middle of this dark and dank room is an iron cage with a man locked inside. And so it's the iron cage, not the iron gate. But this man is locked inside this cage. And the man is obviously despondent and depressed. So Christian asks him, what is wrong? And the man explains that while he used to follow the path to the celestial city, he had turned away now and was trapped in this cage and could not get out. He said to Christian, I am now a man of despair and shut up in this iron cage. I cannot get out. Oh, now I cannot. I have so hardened my heart. Listen to this, he says. I have so hardened my heart that I cannot repent. God has denied me repentance. Now we can argue about the theology behind the idea that God had denied him repentance. But if we do that, we miss the point. And what is the point? Well, as they're leaving the room, interpreter says to Christian, let this man's misery be remembered by you and be an everlasting caution to you. This was a warning. You see, the truth is, God never turns anyone away who repents. It is our refusal to repent, and it is our refusal to repent, not God's willingness to forgive, that keeps us locked in iron cages. When we turn from our sins and turn to God, we are set free. A simple definition of repentance is that it's a change of mind that leads to a change of conduct. But in addition to that simplistic definition, this morning I want to suggest to you six truths about repentance and what it means to repent. And to help us remember these six truths, I want to use the word repent, R-E-P-E-N-T, as an acrostic. So six truths about repentance. Number one, the letter R. Repentance starts with lament. Lament is not a word we use much, and it's something that we practice even less. You see, I'm afraid too often we want a feel-good gospel. We want a comfortable God who looks the other way at our sins, and not just our personal sins, but also our societal sins and our national sins. We want a God who blesses us in spite of us. In the words of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, what we really want is cheap grace. And Bonhoeffer writes in his book, cheap grace means grace sold on the market um, like something that is not worth much. The sacraments, the forgiveness of sins, and the consolation of religion are thrown away at cut rate prices. What would grace be if it were not cheap? Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance, baptism without church discipline, communion without confession, absolution without personal confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate. See, before you can truly repent, you must first be convinced of your need to repent. 
There must be a deep sorrow that brings you to your knees. The prophet Jeremiah, known as the weeping prophet, understood the importance of lament and, and, and this type of lament that leads to repentance. In fact, he wrote an entire book about it. The book of Lamentations. The book of Lament. Lamentations is a collection of sorrow poems about the destruction of Jerusalem because of the people's refusal to repent. And here is but one example of Jeremiah's lament. This is Lamentations chapter 2, verses 18 and 19. He says, the hearts of the people cry out to the Lord. See that sorrow? Crying out to God. O wall of the daughter of Zion, let your tears flow like a river day and night. Give yourself no relief, your eyes no rest. Arise, cry out in the night as the watches of the night begin. Pour out your heart like water in the presence of the Lord. Lift up your hands to him for the lives of your children who faint from hunger at the head of every street. Repentance can only happen after a time of lament, deep sorrow. The letter E, encounters with God are often preceded by times of, repent, of repentance. Does God seem far away in your life? Has it been a long time since you've experienced God? Have you ever had an encounter with God? Now please hear me. God can do what He wants to do, when He wants to do it, and how He wants to do it. But often, not all the time, but often we will not encounter God until we first repent. If John the Baptist were alive today, he would be one of those crazy street preachers screaming into a megaphone, shouting, repent. The Bible says that John wore clothing made of camel hair in Mark chapter 1 verse 6. And this clothing made of camel hair was the clothing of someone in deep sorrow, someone in lament. It says he wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist and he ate locusts and wild honey. I've always pictured John the Baptist having long hair and a beard, but the Bible doesn't say that. But that's just how I've always pictured him. What the Bible does say is that John the Baptist's mission was to be a voice of one calling in the desert. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight paths for him. Matthew 3, 3. So John the Baptist's whole mission was to prepare for someone who was coming after him. But how was he to do that? How was he to make preparations for someone else? The Bible says he did that by preaching repentance. The Bible says in Mark chapter 1, verses 4 through 5, And so John came baptizing in the desert region and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins, and they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. You see, John the Baptist never forgot his mission to prepare the way, nor his message. And Mark chapter 1, verse 7 through 8 tells us, he says, After me will come one more powerful than I, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And though Jesus Christ was about to break into history, before Jesus could come, John had to prepare the way by preaching repentance. People were about to encounter God in a brand new way. But before they could, repentance had to come first. And so does God seem far away in your life? Has it been a long time since you've experienced God? Have you ever had a true encounter with Him? Often, 
before you can encounter God, you have to repent. The letter P, R-E-P. Personal repentance is required for entrance into God's kingdom. Back in Mark chapter 1, we see the introduction of John the Baptist and his mission and his message. Later on in that chapter, the Bible says that as John was preaching this baptism of repentance, Jesus came to him to be baptized. John's baptism was, uh, Jesus' baptism was not for repentance because he had never sinned. Rather, Jesus' baptism was for revelation, revealing who he was and who he is. And through Jesus Christ is the kingdom of God. After his baptism, after John baptized Jesus, Jesus went into the desert to be tempted by Satan for 40 days. And this is all in Mark chapter 1. While he was away in the desert being, being tempted by Satan, John the Baptist was put in prison for preaching repentance. And then the Bible says in Mark chapter 1 verse 14, Jesus came out of the desert and went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. Now, what was that good news of God? The reason I ask this is because I think most of us, we miss it. We think the good news of God is, is something else. The good news of God is that we can go to heaven instead of hell. But here it says Jesus went into Galilee preaching the good news of God. And so the question is, what is the good news of God? What is the gospel message? And in the very next verse, Mark chapter 1, verse 15, Jesus tells us what that good news is. Jesus said, the time has come. The kingdom of God is near or it's at hand. It's here right now. The time has come. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. The good news, the gospel, is that the kingdom of God breaks into your life and becomes your reality through your faith, believe in Jesus Christ. But entrance into God's kingdom is through repentance. If you are, it is, it is you stopping the direction you are headed in and turning around and walking in another direction, walking in, in the way of Jesus, walking in a new path, a new direction, walking in a new way of living life. Repent and believe the good news. Now, a big part of this new life is continual repentance. This is the letter E. Every day, continual. Every day, repentance is a spiritual discipline that strengthens your faith. Our need for continual daily repentance is the key lesson behind Jesus washing his disciples' feet. This story is found in John chapter 13, and I ask you to turn in your Bibles there. John chapter 13, verses 1 through 17. I'm not going to read the entire thing, but that's, this is the story of Jesus washing his disciples' feet. And the key message is not humility. The key message is our need for continual daily cleansing of sin. Repentance. The story goes like this in John chapter 13. Jesus knew that the time of his execution was close at hand, and so he prepared a meal for his disciples. We call that meal the Last Supper. John, not John the Baptist, but John the Elder who wrote the Gospel of John, John picks up the story at the end of the meal. And so John doesn't talk about the Lord's Supper. The other Gospel writers do John picks up at the end of that. So John writes in John chapter 13, verse 2. The evening meal was being served. The devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. 
So Jesus starts to wash his disciples' feet. When he gets to Peter, when he kneels down to wash Peter's feet, Peter objected. And the following conversation took place between Jesus and Peter as the other disciples watched. John says in John chapter 13, verse 8, No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Peter protested. Jesus answered by saying, Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Peter responded by proclaiming, as only Peter could do, full of himself, all of that. He said, don't wash my feet. Jesus says, if I don't wash your feet, you don't have anything to do with me. And then Peter says in verse 9, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Peter saying, that's the case, God. Give me a whole bath. Jesus then replied, and this is the lesson about our need for continual repentance. Jesus replied in verse 10, a person who has had a bath needs only to wash his feet. His whole body is clean, and you are clean. And then he makes a reference to Judas, though not every one of you. When you repent and believe, placing your faith in Jesus Christ, you are washed clean by the baptism of the Holy Spirit through the grace, mercy, and love of God. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. You are now a citizen of God's kingdom, but you are living as an immigrant in an unknown land. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. And so as you walk through this life as a citizen of God's kingdom, as you walk through this life, you will stumble and fall from time to time. You will make mistakes, and you're going to get sidetracked, and, and you're going to get discouraged. In short, while living in this world, even as a forgiven citizen of God's kingdom, you will sin. And so what do you do when you sin? Do you lose your salvation and have to get re-saved and re-baptized? Absolutely not. You don't need a bath, Jesus says. You've already been washed. All you need to do is to repent of those daily sins. And when you do that, Jesus will wash your feet with the waters of his love, mercy, and grace, and he will forgive you of those sins. You see, we need continual repentance because in this life, we will continually fall short. It was to believers who had already placed their faith in Jesus that John said in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, if, you confess, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all unrighteousness. Practicing the spiritual discipline of repentance will strengthen your life. R-E-P-E-N. Not only for personal sins, we also need to repent of our national sins. This truth is a little tricky, but it's extremely important and it's very biblical. We in our society, we have become so individualistic, we think that the only sins we need to repent of are our own personal sins. However, as followers of Jesus, we have been called, commissioned, and empowered to stand in the gap and to be repairers of the breach, confessing the sins of our nation. A great example of what it means and what it looks like to repent of national sins is Daniel's prayer of repentance on behalf of Israel in Daniel chapter 9, verses 1 through 19. Turn to Daniel chapter 9. 
In just a second, we're going to read this prayer. And as we read this prayer, I want you to notice how many times in this prayer, Daniel says, we, us, and our. Daniel identifies himself with the sins of the nation, even though he himself was righteous and innocent of those sins. Furthermore, many of the sins that he mentions uh, were committed generations ago. Daniel, Daniel had nothing to do with them. He wasn't alive. He wasn't there. Personally, he had nothing to do with them. But he knew that those sins were the reason Israel was in the mess they were in at that time. And here's the point. Daniel repents of the sins of the nation. Even though he was not personally responsible for those sins. And likewise, as followers of Jesus, we can and should repent of the sins of our nation, both past and present. Even though we may think, at least, we are innocent of those sins, personally. This can also be applied to the sins of our family and of our ancestors. And so let's read this carefully thoughtfully and prayerfully. And as a side note, this is just one of many examples of the prophets in the Old Testament repenting of sins of the nation. Daniel chapter 9. Verse 3, Daniel says, So I turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him in prayer, in petition, in fasting, and in sackcloth and ashes. Those are all symbols of of repentance. I pray to the Lord my God and, and confess. O oh Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with all, with all who love him and obey his commands. We have sinned and done wrong. <clears throat> we have been wicked and have rebelled. We have turned away from our commands and, and from your commands and laws. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and all the people of the land. Lord, you are righteous, but this day we are covered with shame, the men of Judah, the people of Israel, and all Israel, both near and far, and in all the countries where you have scattered us because of our unfaithfulness to you, O Lord. O oh Lord, we and our kings, our princes, he's praying for his governmental leaders, confessing their sins, repenting of their sins, our fathers, we are all covered with shame because we have sinned against you. The Lord our God is merciful and forgiving, even though we have rebelled against him. We have not obeyed the Lord our God or kept the laws he gave us through his servant, the prophets. All Israel has transgressed your law and turned away, refusing to obey you. Therefore, the curses and sworn judgments written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out on us because we have sinned against you. You have fulfilled the words spoken against us and against our rulers by bringing upon us great disaster. Under the whole heaven, nothing has ever been done like what has been done to Jerusalem. Just as it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come upon us, yet we have not sought the favor of the Lord, our God, by turning from our sins and giving attention to your truth. The Lord did not hesitate to bring the disaster upon us, for the Lord, our God, is righteous in everything he does, yet we have not obeyed him. Now, O Lord our God, who brought your people out of Egypt with a mighty hand and who made for yourself a name that endures to this day, we have sinned, we have done wrong, O Lord, in keeping with all your righteous acts. Turn away your anger and your wrath from Jerusalem, your city, your holy city, our sins and, and the iniquities of our fathers, there's those past things, our sins and the iniquities of our fathers and made Jerusalem and your people an object of scorn to all those around us. Now, notice verse 17. Now, our God, hear the prayers and petition of your servant. 
For your sake, O Lord, look with favor on your desolate sanctuary. David is cried out to God saying, God, I repent of all these national sins. Now, God, hear from me. I want you to forgive us. Verse 8, give ear, O God, and hear. Open your eyes and see the desolation of the city that bears your name. We do not make request of you because we are righteous, but because of your great mercy. Maybe you need to read that verse again. We do not make request of you because we are righteous, but because of your great mercy. O oh Lord, listen. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, hear and act for your sake. O oh my God. It's the only time he uses a personal pronoun. Oh my God. Do not delay because your city and your people bear your name. Now before you begin to repent for our nation, remember that you are repenting for our national sins, not your personal sins or somebody else's personal sins. You are repenting of sins that our governmental leaders have committed through bad policies and horrible decisions. Sins that our forefathers committed either intentionally or ignorantly or out of arrogance. We, we repent of sins, so, and so that is why we continue to repent of our sins of racism, of white supremacy, and genocide. You cannot say, I wasn't alive back there. My family didn't own slaves. No, no. You repent of the sins of your fathers. We repent for our hard-heartedness and our policies that favor the rich over the poor. We repent for not providing health care to the sick and housing to the homeless and for incarcerating more people than anywhere else on earth. We repent for the sin of capital punishment. We repent of the sin of using abortion as birth control and not protecting the sanctity of all life. We repent for our sins that have harmed other nations and treated foreigners as less than human. We repent for equating any political ideology with our faith in Jesus. We repent for doing incredible harm and using violence in the name of Jesus. We repent for not protecting the sanctity of marriage and family. We repent of our militarism and our consumerism and our hedonism and our secularism. We repent for our greed and our lust for power and for somehow believing that our nation is somehow more important to God than any other nation. We repent for believing lies and spreading slander and untruths. Oh Lord, listen. Oh Lord, forgive. Oh Lord, hear and act. We can and should repent for national sins as much as we do our own personal sins. R E P E N T. T. The church is in serious need of repentance. Phyllis Tickle, one of the most influential authorities on religion in America in my lifetime, and she died, I think, in 2015. But Phyllis Tickle said in one of her books, every 500 years, the church cleans out its attic and has a giant rummage cell. In other words, every 500 years or so, the church gets rid of all the clutter and trash that have been built up over the centuries. Right now in the 21st century, we the church are in the middle of this half millennial purging. We have collected the unnecessary clutter of celebrity pastors, mega buildings, mega budgets, and Christian nationalism, just to name a few of the garbage. And those things have got to be purged from our faith. We don't need to have a rubbish cell as much as we need to have a spring cleaning and get rid of all the trash 
that we have collected over the years. And the first step in doing that is to repent. Like the church in Laodicea, we think we are the one, we, we think we are one thing when in reality we are another. So if you would, one more time, turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 3, and let's listen to the words of Jesus to the church in America today. Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. To the angel of the church in Laodicea, write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and do not need a thing. But you, but you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, naked. I counsel you to buy from me, go refining the fire so you can become rich, and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and sad to put on your eyes so you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, he, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Jesus was calling the church of Laodicea, and he's calling the church in the United States to repent. My heart breaks for the church in the United States. We have lost our way. And the only path back is repentance. Now I know this is a heavy sermon. I pray, and pray a lot, but I pray that I have spoken the truth in love, and I pray I have spoken thus saith the Lord, and not thus saith the devil. All I can say is, aren't you glad you didn't have to get dressed up and leave your house to hear this message? Aren't you glad you don't have to hang around after church and help us tear down? I try my best to summarize my sermons in one sentence. I call that the propositional statement. And it's at the very beginning of all of my outlines, propositional statement. Here's the one sentence. And then I try to build the entire sermon around that one single sentence. So what was the sentence for this long sermon? Well, here it is. Repentance is turning from your former way of life because you realize it has been wrong and turning to God for forgiveness so that you may be set free and live a victorious life. And all of those six truths back up that one statement. If you can remember that, that is enough. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, I pray that uh, your truth has been spoken and not uh, my opinion. So Lord, I pray that wherever we're watching this, driving or sitting on the couch or still in bed, I pray that we would just take a few moments to repent. Forgive us, Lord, of our known sins and even forgive us of our own unknown sins. Lord, help us to repent as individuals, as people. Help us to repent for the sins of our nation, past and present. And Lord, as a church, we repent of how we have lost sight at times and how we've gotten sidetracked and how we place things that aren't important and make them the most important thing. Lord, we repent. Forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name.
Once again, thank you uh, for joining us today in worship. Uh, please feel free to, to share this, uh, you know, share the link either from Facebook or YouTube with your friends. And uh, if you're watching on YouTube, make sure you subscribe uh, to the channel so you'll get updates when we 
have other recordings. Pastor Kevin Burns still preaches most every Wednesday, so you can listen to him uh, coming at you from uh, uh, Riverbend uh, Prison, and I know he's encouraged uh, by that. Um, I pray that today you have been challenged, you've been encouraged, but you've also been convicted, and that God has spoken to your heart, and you have uh, done what you need to do with, with God. Before we leave, let's say our prayer together for 2021. This is FCC's 2021 prayer. Uh, say this with me. May the light of our Lord Jesus Christ shine brightly in your heart and on your face so that you reflect the glory of God and the good news of the gospel to everyone you encounter. Amen. Have a good week.